Hello, everyone. I'm Maggie Hansen. I'm an assistant professor at the school. And as a member of the CAD advisory board, I'm delighted to welcome everyone to the first CAD forum of the semester. Uh, the Center for American Architecture and Design, affectionately known as CAD, has a mission to provide a platform for collaborative critical scholarship from the varied disciplines at the School of Architecture. And as a part of this, every two weeks, we host a about every two weeks, we host a Friday lunch forum, um, which is meant as an informal space to discuss topics and research in process. Uh, after the presentation, we hope uh, to have time for questions and discussion. And um, this is being streamed, of course, on Zoom and YouTube, and we'll be paying attention to questions uh, in the chat on both platforms. Um, and also, if you are on Zoom, uh, please feel free to raise your hand and um, we will take that as a, as a live question. I also just, um, before we turn to today's talk, I uh, hope that you'll check um, the schedule online for the rest of the CAD uh, forum uh, series. We have a great lineup this semester. But I also wanna remind you that um, we have a special event on February 11th which is uh, this year's We Need to Talk About, um, which is focused on homelessness. And it brings together guests representing uh, perspectives from policy, academia, activism, and grassroots efforts, as well as uh, students from the School of Architecture. It will begin at 1 p.m. in the Nibane Gallery. And it really uh, looks to be an amazing conversation um, on some very urgent and complicated issues. Uh, so we hope that you can attend that as well. Today's talk, uh, Water in Cities, A History of Cultural Waterscapes, uh, will be presented by Associate Professor Michael Holleran um, of Historic Preservation. He has uh, a background in practice in an architecture and planning firm in Providence, Rhode Island, and led the Landmarks Board in Boulder, Colorado, among other things. Um, his previous book, Boston's Changeful Times, Origins of Preservation and Planning in America, was the recipient of multiple awards and put the early preservation movement within the context of environmental changes and controls on urban development. Uh, the talk today is associated with um, work, I understand, on a book about irrigation canals and the urban landscapes of the American West, and is also uh, I understand a promo for what sounds like an incredible fall course that he'll be teaching. Um, I look forward to uh, hearing more about this. Welcome, Michael. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much, Maggie. Uh, as 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 Maggie uh, said, I have I am working on a book, The Urban Ditch: uh, Landscape, Life, and Afterlives. Uh, this is not about that. I gave a center talk about that a couple of years ago, uh, but this grows indirectly out of the book project because I have also, as part of that, been uh, doing broad reading in water in cities to contextualize my work. And while even I recognize that acequias and canals is probably a little bit too narrow a boutique course to offer to you all. When I started to look at the scope of water in cities, it is a very large subject, a, I think, very uh, important course. And I'm a little bit surprised that I'm not able to find any models for how to do it. So this is a first essay at uh, trying to scan all of these subjects, all of these subjects that are urban waterscapes historically viewed. Uh, uh, what I have already gotten out of it, but I hope to get out of today's uh, audience, is how, how to give shape to this as a course. By August, I need a syllabus, help me. Uh, so, I've, uh, this, is, this is a scan of all these subjects. I have arbitrarily uh, organized it chronologically around Providence as an armature, as, uh, 
as Maggie alluded, that's something that was easier for me to do than uh, other cities. And it's valuable, it's valuable for this as a, uh, uh, as a counterpoint, as a very different city from San Antonio and Los Angeles and Phoenix, where I've been spending my research, where my research head has been for a few years. So, uh, uh, but it's not a course about Providence. It's, uh, uh, this could be done with any city. In fact, that's one of the hypotheses here. Every city is a, is a, an intensive waterscape history. From here on, uh, the presentation through the chronological, through most of it will be timed. That's to make sure that you have time to read the stuff and to make sure that I don't have time to explain all of it. Uh, you can ask questions after. <clears throat> the details of household water varied by city. They varied by places and by groups within the city. Uh, primordial means such as wells, pump, pumps, taking water from the acequia, refusing to take water from the acequia and buying it. Uh, water for animals. Animals were an essential part of urban landscapes throughout history and actually more so in the 19th century with the industrial use of horses. Take a look at the image on the left. We'll be, uh, we'll be coming back to this spot. Port cities throughout time have articulated elaborate infrastructure, continually refined infrastructure to make themselves nodes in a global, uh, global network of movement uh, at the city level. This is one of the main determinants of landscape. Water is not only a means of communication, it is a barrier to communication and transportation, the means of crossing, the means of overcoming those barriers have varied from fords across shallow water to crazy elaborate uh, crossings such as the transporter bridge in Marseille. Water is a source of food. Uh, water is within city limits is a source of food as in the oyster industry of Narragansett Bay, including right there off the water, uh, watch the oysters harvested for your, for your lunch at the late 19th century uh, and from the port. Access to water uh, is one of the most contested, continually contested, uh, uh, arenas of spatial control in urban form. And that continues over centuries over different purposes of access, different purposes at the same time as you see with the strollers on the levee in New Orleans. The weight of falling water gave the first source of power for urban industrialization other than human muscles and animal muscles. Uh, and that in places where there was a lot of water to fall and in crazy places like Los Angeles where there was very little water. Water is a destroyer. Water uh, can wipe out whole cities as it did in Los Angeles in 1815, the same year that it very nearly did in Providence four years before it very nearly did in San Antonio, uh, seven, 85 years before it did in Galveston. Making artificial channels of water was oddly the first modern, in, uh, I won't say industrialized, artificial means of land communication. Uh, the Erie Canal, completely rewired the urban network of North America uh, and others 
others tried. The canals, uh, canals in all periods have been relatively short-lived and have often been cannibalized for land transportation, as we see here in 17th century, uh, New Amsterdam become New York. Uh, in 19th century Providence Canal become railroad right of way. Arms of the sea, reaches of rivers are appropriated by cities and reshaped as organs of major, uh, major urban form. Uh, Waterfronts are one of the most uh, uh, most important determinants of social landscape. Waterfront labor and waterfront neighborhoods uh, in the social landscape of cities and the social history of cities, and also in the earliest attempts to regulate social dysfunction. Modern water distribution systems uh, were one of the most important, the by far the most expensive urban infrastructure of in this country, the primarily the 19th century. Uh, when they were built, they were often celebrated in the landscape along with changing it. One of their changes was that those systems in order to function required regulating reservoirs uh, to maintain the, the appropriate water pressure. They were inherently conspicuous parts of the urban landscape because they needed to be central, they needed to be on a high point. Constructed bodies of water uh, had always been, became more important as an element in the palette for urban landscape design. Shoreline became not only utilitarian, but an amenity for urban development as leisure increased, as accessibility both by land and by water uh, increased and became available to, large, to, to mass urban populations. Shorefronts also became not only a utilitarian, but an amenity uh, driving the residential development, uh, driving the, the shape of urban form and urban development. Frozen water can be urban water as a commodity for trade and uh, uh, basis of infrastructure, as an amenity, as a hazard. Uh, and in each of these cases, it can serve more than one of those functions for different people at the same time. Water always and increasingly as cities grew became a, uh, a sink for disposing of wastes, uh, whether the, the uh, meat packing wastes shoveled through the floor uh, into the river in Providence, the petroleum wastes in Los Angeles. Water is the prerequisite for land making. Uh, land making is the cannibal cannibalization of water uh, for urban purposes, very often urban purposes that are spatially demanding and would be uh, impossible or nearly so within tight urban fabric. When it's not possible to make land by filling the water for one reason or another, it's always possible to cover it. So other ways of cannibalizing the waterscape in service of terrestrial 
uh, uh, infrastructure. For millennia, that has been the approach uh, to wetlands, wetlands being an uncomfortable uh, from an urban landscape perspective, thing between land and water. The reflex has been make land of it. Not always a pretty process. As cities grew, as their waste streams grew, uh, another kind of infrastructure developed to try to mitigate those waste streams. Um, first to try to send them farther away, but eventually to try to do something with them to make them less wasteful or less disturbing. Fountains are the most animating focal points of urban design. And I should have had a Las Vegas one. Uh, they are they are also assertions of oasis identity or wannabe oasis identity. Water is both a barrier to and a means of migration. Uh, it's, it's, it's barrierness is what makes it a path the means of, of uh, the means of which become the migration paths. Water is also a medium for human hygiene, which it has been for millennia and for millennia with one or another social dimension, social and cultural meanings to its public arrangements. Water is intertwined in other infrastructure systems as the material for steam, as the material for coolant, for processes that use heat, as the means of access for the fuels that produce the steam that need to be cooled, that are part of the infrastructure systems. Uh, water, is probably the most conspicuous example of urban infrastructure reaching far beyond the city, um, often at great cost to people elsewhere and landscapes elsewhere. Those urban reservoirs, as the uh, pressure controls grew more sophisticated and mechanized, uh, uh, became less necessary and unnecessary and became themselves another opportunity for cannibalization or in Houston's case for different kind of, of reuse outside of the system. Um, permanent crossings of water bodies have always been iconic, have been urban icons. Uh, which may not be exactly the right word for tunnels, but you get the idea. Part of the landscape identity, I guess that's iconic. Too much water continues to be a particular urban vulnerability. Uh, uh, and as Superstorm Sandy showed the, the uh, the results could be disproportionate to the amount of water, uh, precisely because of the network vulnerability, the, the vulnerability of networks. We respond to that vulnerability with increasingly massive infrastructure interventions. As waterfront land uses centripetally 
distribute themselves away from the center toward uh, greater space, deeper water, those parts of the waterfront become available for new kinds of amenity reuse in urban landscape and urban design. Uh, adaptive use is a different version of that response to uh, uh, centripetally uh, uh, departing waterfront uses. And adaptive use is itself a part of another uh, long development over much of the 20th century toward a more urban view of water amenity in the city. Water heritage itself, uh, the subject of this talk, I suppose, has itself become a land use, has become a, a feature in the urban landscape. Daylighting waters. Uh, we are reversing a century earlier part of the, of the story uh, uh, as water has become more valued. We have brought it back where we earlier cannibalized it. At an even larger scale, we have reshaped other non-water related infrastructure that once was <clears throat> taking advantage of undervalued water sites. Uh, we've kicked out ways, we've kicked out some railroads to put a higher value and, and reuse the water. And finally, uh, water and light together are perhaps the most evocative ingredients for urban spectacle. <clears throat> okay, so that was a sampler. That was a forced march through one version uh, uh, not random, but arbitrary version. It could have been uh, uh, another version of that could have been done, organized around different cities, organized with different themes. But you get the idea. There's a lot of stuff here. It is highly varied stuff. How does one organize it? Uh, what I've done so far, you... Uh, you are perceptive enough to see, used three, um, three different ways to do that. I, uh, I organized it chronologically using Providence as, my, as, as the armature uh, and chronologically on each slide with the, uh, with the comparison. So chron chronology is one. Urban biography, Providence, or any other, do it with San Antonio, do it with Los Angeles, do it with the city of your choice, urban biography, um, and a comparative approach, which was each slide's variations on, on a theme. Uh, those are three. Each of them has problems. Uh, each of them has value. Each of them has problems. Chronology works for individual cities. Um, there are some things where chronology cuts across cities reasonably well. The development of uh, steam-powered transportation is something that's a chronological point across most of the globe. But mostly at the level of the landscape, um, chronological phases don't work well across multiple cities. So, Sticking with single cities, 
<clears throat> the urban biography, uh, which I think is a uh, I, I think is a necessary way to understand waterscapes because they are particular to place. They are particular to history. Uh, uh, but the urban biography, um, uh, first, there are very few of them, but there are uh, few, if any of them, that take as broad a view of waterscape, of water in the city, as, uh, uh, as what I'm looking to do. I should perhaps take that as a hint that I've taken too big a bite. Uh, and comparative approach, which is also, I think, absolutely necessary, but it still leaves the question of comparing what? Uh, do we compare, do we, do we start with morphology? Do we start with geological morphology? There are rivers, there are oases, there are uh, coastlines. And, and do we start with urban morphology, urban typology? There are port cities, there are river cities, there are, uh, um, there are urban functions of kinds of ports, uses of cities, agricultural water-oriented cities. Uh, so a comparative approach also essential, also not quite answering the question. Uh, we organize by scale. Uh, the scales involved in this are everything we do in the school, uh, from the small scale, from the, the smaller than site design of fountains, uh, uh, swimming pools, through parts of cities, through whole cities, and on to the, uh, uh, to the scale of the urban water system watershed, the, the water tap in your kitchen watershed of Los Angeles, which is uh, larger than the state of Texas. It's, are we allowed to say that larger than the state of Texas? Uh, this is, um, this I think is, is least satisfactory as, a, as an overall theme, mostly because what what seems most important to me or most interesting to me are the connections among uh, these scales, the connections between the swimming pools or the fountains in Las Vegas or the swamp coolers in mid-century Arizona and the demands that created regional scale water systems, uh, uh, for example. Do we look at it through, uh, through systems? On the left, that water, uh, that engineering infrastructure system of Los Angeles water, uh, which I should say is a natural hydrological uh, regional diagram appropriated, reshaped, and turned into an engineering infrastructure system. Uh, the limnological ecology, is that right? Limnological ecology uh, of a stream, uh, the natural ecology that becomes urban ecology in the urban landscape, the global trade networks around ports, um, we can fill in multiple systems, and these two are necessary as part of an organization scheme. Uh, uh, they, to some extent, track urban disciplines, uh, engineering, economics, ecology, and that is both their value and their problem because this aspires to be uh, completely interdisciplinary. This aspires to look, yes, at the systems, but then at the connections among the systems. So uh, this was going to be my last slide, but um, uh, as I keep throwing this out and redoing it and throwing it out and redoing it, I thought I would share 
throw it out and redo it version, I don't know, number 18. This is uh, yesterday's reshaping of uh, um, a version of organizing that I think encompasses everything I'm trying to do. Uh, I don't know that this will be the syllabus, but uh, so all of you who are listening, um, uh, you will help me, a few of you may be able to help me directly and say, hey, the course that you're looking to teach is over here and go look at the syllabus and get on with it um, or offer any other helpful suggestions. But any of you, uh, if you are watching this and you are a student uh, and you have seen, let's say more than one slide that looked like something that you would be very interested in digging into, then you're probably the audience I'm looking for and just having some idea what you're thinking, what, uh, what looks interesting, what you were certain that you would see and you cannot believe that I left out. Uh, so I'm all yours, ask, thank you. Okay, I see, I, I see how this works. Michael Oden. Oh, I, I didn't realize I'd be first out of the gate. Um, yeah, yes, I mean, this is like a really fascinating, um, you know, the way you've kind of edged out this, this domain. And, you know, just trying to kind of the seat of pants, make sense of it just from my own perspective. I mean, it, it does seem from kind of one direction that there is a kind of temporal pattern or coherence. Mm -hmm. And when, when we think about water and let's just say urban conurbations of some kind, uh, water supports the population, obviously. Uh, water supports transportation and water supports industry. And at the same time, you have this kind of process of demographic and technological change, whereby it seems like in a relatively coherent temporal pattern, water to support industry and water to, to support transportation has substantially diminished over the last two centuries. Uh, and then those uses, and of course, it's still important for transportation, but the port systems have been really consolidated, containerization, et cetera. But it seems like those two uses have really diminished in terms of supporting urban life. And the water that was kind of supporting them is now largely allocated to kind of amenities of various sorts. So does that make, I mean, I was just trying to make sense of it myself. Does that resonate at all or? Well, I. I... I think there's a lot of a lot of what you're saying is yes, uh, uh, but on the other hand, you know, as you're uh, as you're describing the water use of industry uh, uh, diminishing, I'm thinking, well, okay, okay, but the uh, water rights adjudication in New Mexico for the last several decades has been driven by uh, semiconductor manufacturing needs for water. So uh, uh, you're definitely right that uh, uh, these kinds of demands ebb and flow and absolutely right that the amenity uses of water uh, uh, have, have a, a a sort of secular growth to them, but I, I have to, and yeah. Uh, uh, but even that, you know, amenity uses of water millennia ago uh, were were sort of the early adopter, you know, dr early adopter driving technology and consumption. Uh, but uh, you know, there there are there are definitely long trends uh, uh, and 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 then the exceptions you know 
sort of point you toward looking developmentally at, well, why is this place different? Alan, I, I, I see hand. Yeah, I, yes, I have a hand up. Uh, I have, thank you for this talk. And I have lots of things that I might say, so I'll only say some of them. Um, well, so the first is there's the truism that water takes the shape of the vessel you put it in. But what you're really doing is how a city takes the shape of the water it's got. And so there is an inversion of the way, we'll say it, non-built environment people might think about water versus what you're doing. And then related to that, well, in, related in my head, not probably to most people, is that it's when you showed the, the Rem Coolhouse book cover of the small, medium, large, extra large. I think that could be it, but it might actually be instead more of a quality of water, which is still slow, fast, or smooth and turbulent, mm -hmm. not just territorially. And then again, still in my head, making a different connection. And you started to touch on this when you were talking with Michael Oden about water rights in New Mexico, which is, I think there's a, another cross cutting question, which is does or how does water have standing? And so there is you know, the shifting boundaries when, when, when the Rio Grande moves and does Mexico get a little bit of land or do we get a little land? There's it's always a dissolution of a boundary. Like when you think about something like Budapest, now one city, but relatively recently in the history of that city, one city, the river separated them. Oh, and Juarez and El Paso are the opposite case. Yeah. And so I think that um, in a, or that at a bigger scale than just a city, there's the watershed management of New Zealand as a political unit. Mm -hmm. And so I, and, and across those, there's something I think about a kind of agency of water, either mm -hmm. it's direct agency or, or a collective agency through it that provides a different cross-cutting thread. Mm -hmm. Maybe there was a question in there, or maybe it was just me rambling. I, I, I don't need a question. That's, I, there's lots of chewy stuff in there that I'm chewing on. So yeah, I, I will keep chewing on those. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, the still, slow, and fast. Uh, I mean, what, water does have agency in a way that other uh, um, in a way that other parts of the non-human world also have agency. And I, 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 I've been, I think I've been mulling on this with different language, uh, you know, thinking about earth, water, air, and fire. And I think now that you've given me different language, I think the, uh, uh, part of the specialness of water, um, so, some of what I have been musing on is that, is that water appears to us very dynamic. We recognize its aid, agency. Land is equally dynamic, but you need a fast forward. You, most of the time, if you're not in coastal California, you, know, you, need, you need to view it over centuries and millennia to see how it's moving. Uh, so I think some of what reads to us as agency is the fact that water acts on a time scale that is much faster than land, much slower than fire or, or air, which to, to us, when they do something to us, it seems like it came from nowhere and happened in an instant. Uh, uh, but it's, it, uh, and, and I think, um, the one the one part I'll disagree uh, not disagree with but I'll I'll complicate it more for you I think cities uh, uh, take the shape of their water container at a at a point at a at, you know uh, till a point in their evolution and then they shape the water and again Los Angeles would be uh, uh, very oddly for people perceiving LA or Phoenix today, they were cited for water and they were cited because they had good water, good permanently flowing 
water to support a lot of people. It's just that a lot of people were, you know, wasn't 10 million. Uh, it was a hundred thousand. Uh, uh, so at a certain point, the agency shifted some from the water, from the river to the city. Uh, and the, you know, the water will have the last word. I think I, I have a comment related to Steve's, uh, Alan's meditation on scale, um, mm -hmm. which is a slightly different uh, thought on that, which um, it occurred to me uh, based on the slide that like the scales were related to uh, scales of ownership and control, right? That um, there's the pool and then we start to get up uh, to larger municipal and regional scales of relationships to water. Um, but I'm really interested in the scale of the human body and the associations of you know, socially and culturally associated with water. And I'm curious if that starts to map onto a chronology of um, thinking about cultural imagination associated with water and how we start to associate um, the sharing of water as a resource or the risk that water presents to a group of people, a piece of land as a shared risk, right? A shared resource versus a shared risk and how that chain perhaps changes um, over the evolution of a city's history or over a sort of even the trajectory of globalization, um, thinking about resources of exchange across huge bodies of water. And I think it, it just is that cultural relationship um, that would be interesting to me to also think about as, uh, as a portion of form and celebration. I, I agree with you. Uh, and, I, and I will say that the, uh, uh, the, both the sort of engineering system and perhaps the natural ecological, you know, each of those systems uh, uh, in my way of approaching this is a, a knowledge prerequisite. I mean, under, having an understanding of what's going on in the terms of the people who are attempting control uh, or who are, you know, the, the uh, is, um, uh, is is a starting point. And the starting point is to have an idea what's going on so that you can then look at what people are doing with it and that, you know, what people are doing socially, what people are doing in cultural reception, what people are doing in the more distributed uh, landscape. Um, and I also, very much agree that the human body, I mean, the, the, the most loaded slide in the same, in the whole thing, even more to, I believe, happy to hear from others, but uh, even more than the storm slides, the disaster slides is the bath slide, the, uh, uh, the, the intimate human body and water and other humans. Uh, or whether there are other humans, how, how all these things work. And I also agree with you about the, um, the you know, I, I don't know, next level up of social collaboration and control, uh, which in, in my research and my, I'll, I'll say more hardcore historical research becomes a, uh, uh, a, a just sort of bold through line of the extent to which people are able to conceive of cooperation, sharing, and accomplishing things communally, or whether they bollocks themselves up. Uh, now th this is the um, this is the water cultural uh, contrast between the Dutch whose culture has uh, 
this argument is made, and I believe it, uh, uh, grown up around the necessity of cooperation to control water. And the just uh, uh, weird sort of paradoxes of Western US cooperation in a culture that would keep denying that it was cooperating and, and sometimes not bother to cooperate. Uh, but yeah, all, all of this, when I seem to be talking about engineering, I'm trying to understand stuff so I can get on to, to, to look at culture, including the culture of engineers. Uh, Manish, hello. Hi, hi, Michael. Hi, everybody. I'm, I'm crashing in. Uh, Jake, Red, Jake okay. Redman sent me the link. I really enjoyed your talk. Um, I don't have much to add, except that I think it, it's such a flowing and fascinating topic that you might have to use uh, intersectional lenses and framings to uh, in, in your class. I believe, as you're saying, all the systems intersect the engineering and the infrastructure with with even mm -hmm. sort of you know the aesthetics as as you brought, you're already familiar with Jim Westcott's work mm -hmm. in uh, water in in the east so uh, yeah i so not much to add but i'd like to sit in on the class <laughs> well if we uh, uh, if we keep having more outbreaks and keep having Zoom classes, you may be able to without, uh, without too much inconvenience. Uh, let, me, let, let me just, let me say very briefly for, for because uh, uh, everyone that I've heard from so far is someone who I don't think is eligible to enroll in the class. So for, particularly for the people who may be uh, who may have that eligibility and be thinking about it. Um, I, I genuinely do not know how I'm going to organize it, but it is beginning to take shape. And it is, uh, uh, the way that it takes shape is that although I don't know how to, you know, make a chapter outline of all of this stuff, I do have ideas for how to put how, what to do in a classroom with students investigating it is very much uh, going to be organized in a participatory way around investigating different parts of these connections. We will not get to all of them. Which ones we get to will be in large part driven by who's in the class and what you all want to do. Uh, so. I don't know. I have a I have a deadline in a month or two to have figured out more than that, and uh, I'm working on it. Uh, Benjamin, hi, Michael. Uh, hello, everyone. So wonderful uh, to hear you talk, and also about uh, the class, which I think is is highly needed. It made me think about those times when also teaching studio design studio, asking the students about to do something with water, right? Within the context of a, a building or a series of buildings and they really finding a struggle <clears throat> in, in what can actually water do. Um, and I also think about how, uh, for me during the time I have lived in the United States I have seen how water uh, is not a precisely something that is part of the city, right? I mean, we see the big body of water here in Austin, right? But I'm talking about fountains, I'm talking water channel. I mean, things that are kind of urban that have to do with a, a, the, the built environment in general. And uh, I also your slide about heritage made me think about not only the how we see water in terms of a, of a, of a, of a historical context of or a cultural heritage, but also about a, for many in for I think in the context of cultural heritage for many the the place that makes makes it culturally significant has to do with the meaning of what water had for that specific culture, right? 
And this also makes me think about Islamic architecture, which I don't know if you have, you know, fully considered, which I think addresses <laughs> both of the issues that I'm kind of talking about in terms of the urban building scale, but also the meaning and the identification of a culture with a water at different levels that makes a, not only the environment that water that is surrounded or is containing the water a meaningful, but also makes it culturally significant, if you will, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't know, it's just a comment for conversation, but I don't know if you also consider looking into, into that uh, cultural aspect of it. Yeah, the, the uh, uh, as, as a frame for the class in the first time around, I will, I will be teaching from uh, uh, North America and a little bit of Western Europe simply because of my own competency. I am, I am keenly interested in this globally, the water history of Mexico City, the, uh, the, the water history of Islamic cities. I know enough to know how absolutely fascinating they are. Um, and one of the things uh, one of the things that I, I learned and I love about the, the, again, the more hardcore research I'm doing on those canals in cities is that uh, uh, there are, there's a degree of water cultural landscape history that is, uh, uh, there's, a, there's it, it's inherently cross-cultural not to say the differences aren't uh, aren't important, but that the commonalities are compelling. I mean, water you know water freezes at thirty two degrees. It doesn't matter what you call thirty two degrees. It, water flows downhill. Water you know water does these things, and um, different cultures do different things with those facts. It's uh, uh, so again, for, for anyone um, uh, looking at this as a potential class and for my thoughts on where the subject goes in what I hope will be future iterations of it, I will, I will start with the Atlantic Western world where I have a foundation to stand on. I am absolutely interested and welcome anyone who wants to help me broaden my perspective. Um, those, you know, uh, uh, and, and hope one day to be able to do that. Anybody from the student gallery? Well, going once, going twice. I wanna thank everybody for coming out for this uh, fire hose of information. Uh, the the, uh, the metaphors are, uh, I guess, unavoidable, but uh, uh, thank you very much. And um, I am I'm very happy to hear anyone's thoughts, anyone's questions. It's all, uh, uh, it's all helping me frame what I'm trying to do here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. This was really great.